This is Democracy Now! We're broadcasting from the U.N. Climate Summit in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. I'm Amy Goodman. We end today with two indigenous land defenders from Latin America. Andrea Ishu is a Maya Kiche leader, journalist, human rights and environmental defender from Guatemala. Also with us, Rosa Marina Flores Cruz, an indigenous activist and organizer from the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in the state of Oaxaca, Mexico. They both traveled to COP27 with the collective Futuros Indígenas, Indigenous Futures. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Um, Andrea, let's begin with you. Um, the significance of what's taking place today, we just heard um, from the uh, representative of the Amazon talking about Venezuela, Brazil, the lungs of the planet. We don't as often hear from indigenous defenders in Central America. Talk about why you're here. Well, we are here because we are also wanting to talk about what means the, the energy transition to our territories. In the name of a green transition and the creation of renewable energies, Guatemala and the territories of Central America are suffering a lot of explosions of our lands and our territories. A lot of this green capitalism, it's affecting our communities, is displacing people, is creating violence, corruption, and also is perpetuating the genocide and the ecocide in Guatemala and in our territories. And what's your experience been like here at COP27 in Egypt? Well, we, we do know that uh, the expectations about the rich and the powerful, you know, solutions, giving solutions to the climate crisis is not our horizon. We're here to create connections between the grassroots movements, because the real climate solutions are going to be built by the ones that are very close to Earth, right down below, not from the people on the top. We're here also to make clear to the decision makers that we're not going to allow that all this green pollution is coming to our territories. We're saying to them that we will not allow it, that we will resist. And we're here looking a lot of hypocrisy, a lot of the negotiators of the big oil companies coming here and being listening and participating in the negotiations while the indigenous and young activists are being put out from these places for protesting and for demanding, you know, fair trade and just transition from the fossil fuel industry. So I think there's a lot of hypocrisy inside of this space. We're very disappointed in the way that they are trying to create a very, you know, illusion of multicultural space for dialogue, but it's not true. There's a lot of rules for us. We cannot do protests, we cannot do mobilizations, and there's a lot of repression in this society. So we're coming here and looking at these conferences, and we already knew that the solutions for the climate crisis are not coming from here. Andrea, I was wondering if you can link the U.S. relationship with Guatemala to the issue of climate devastation in your country. 1953, the U.S. supports a coup against uh, Mohammed Mossadegh in Iran. 1954, one year later, uh, John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State, he was a corporate attorney for United Fruit, um, uh, is involved in the overthrow of the Jacobo. democratically elected leader of Guatemala, um, uh, Jacobo Arbenz. How does that relate to what we're seeing today? The United States had financed a very long history of genocide and ecocide in Guatemala, and also the protection of um, the monocultive industry and destructive industry. There's a lot of corporate business related to the U.S. in Guatemala, and also the U.S. policies are financing our government to keep and remain the war against the indigenous peoples and communities that are defending the land, the rivers, or ways of living and existing. So there is a very long and nasty relationship from these private corporations, from the U.S. government, uh, with the corrupt authoritarian regime in Guatemala that at this very moment is uh, putting into exile activists, judges, journalists, and they keep financing that extermination of our territories and our lands. So what are you demanding? We are demanding that the, the money is not going to solve the problems of green colonialism in our territories. We are demanding to the United States government to stop financing the extermination of indigenous peoples in Guatemala. Mm. Rosa Marina Flores Cruz is with us from Oaxaca, from the southern state of Mexico. Talk about your concerns about the climate as you come here to COP27. 
Yes, well, us as part of the delegation of Defenders of the Earth, we try to bring the, um, the voices and the demands of different indigenous nations in our country. Uh, we are here people like me in, in my region. We are living the impact of the windmills that are grabbing the lands and dispossessing the territories of the indigenous Binisa and Ikots in our region. Uh, this green energy is selling, it's here, it's, it's being discussed, it's discussed here like a solution. And we are in our territories confronting the uh, how the organized, organized crime is really close to, to the companies and to the governments who are deciding deciding that uh, this is the solution and we need to take it in our territories and give them our space for them to make more money. Also, uh, there is people in our delegation who is facing the um, Deforestation? Deforestation. Deforestation of their lands uh, to be to create monocultives for avocados and for other kind of gro of crops, like selling also this idea that the vegetables are the solution about the climate crisis, and they are dispossessing the lands of the indigenous communities. We are facing dams. We are facing a lot of mega projects that are putting in risk our lives, and that's why we are here to say that uh, as indigenous people. Uh, we have to, we need to be respect our decisions and our agency. We are totally able to decide what we want in our lands and in our territory. And the decisions not just come, uh, must come only, only from the outside. We, uh, we need to be heard and we need to be respect. Your father is from an Afro community yes. in Mexico. Yes. Your mother from the isthmus of uh, Twantepec, if you can talk about how your heritage informs your climate activism. Yes. Well, yes, my, my dad, he is from Coajiniquilapa, from the small coast, <laughs> Costa Chica, in Guerrero. Uh, but I grew up in my indigenous community. I grew up in Cuchitan. My mom, my grandma, before her, uh, they will be like uh, the, the, how the people outside call activists <laughs> since ever. So uh, they, they always uh, had been fighting for, for the lands and for the respect of the, the rights of the community and for uh, the respect of the indigenous communities. Uh, that's, there is where my, my heritage comes. So since I born, I always have known that I must de defend my land and I must to be really proud about who I am. And let's talk about how dangerous that activism is. A report from the nonprofit Global Witness this year revealed that Mexico saw 54 environmental and land defenders killed in 2021, making it one of the most dangerous places in the world to be a climate activist. I mean, in our headlines through this year, every other week, it seemed, we were reporting on um, a Mexican journalist, for example, who was also killed. Talk about what the stakes are in Mexico. Yes, just the last week was murder, another defender of the, of the forest in the center of Mexico. Uh, defend the land is one of the most difficult and uh, dangerous activities that we can do. My own family, we have to leave our region for six months, uh, several years ago, uh, because of the fight of my mom against the windmill projects. So, and also in our in our network, we have uh, compañeras who are being now arrested. Uh, yes, ar Persecuted? Persecuted. Persecuted uh, for her work in defense of the land and, and against pip pipelines and against uh, the, these mega projects that the, the government of Mexico is pushing in our territory. What are these mega projects? The Maya Train, like, is this big tourist touristic project that they are, like, again, they are putting the indigenous people, the Maya indigenous people, as, as objects for the tourism and they are building this big train that is going to to cross to turn out all the peninsula of Yucatan also we have the interoceanic 
train in, in my region, in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, that is like a, another Panama Canal that they want to build uh, like in the, in, the, in the ground. And for us, that we are already living the impacts of the mega projects. And for the, uh, the other company, uh, the other compañera, she's dealing with the pipeline, the uh, Proyecto Integral Morelos, that is been uh, trying to be built in the in the in in the in a volcano. So it's really dangerous for them as communities to have this kind of projects, and the government is just giving more and more impulse to this kind of of things. And finally, Andrea Xchu, as you talk about Guatemala. Um, if you can talk about the, and name names, and it's something you pointed out at the beginning. Here at COP, people should understand that you cannot name names in protests of countries, of individuals, of corporations, if anyone thought the protest is free. And it's not just because it's in Egypt. It happens every year. You can have a protest, but not talk about the country you're talking about. As we wrap up, specifically talk about what you're facing in Guatemala when it comes to mega projects. We're talking about uh, big business, for example, the CGN, Pronickel, Maya company, that it's exterminating the Maya Kekchi population. Just yesterday, a very big group of indigenous Maya Kekchi people was arrested because this company is forcing them to display and displacing them from their lands just to keep building this big mining company that is going to be for the extraction of minerals for the energetic transition. Also, the big mega projects as dams that are financed by the president of the Real Madrid, Florentino Perez, who is owning one of the biggest hydroelectrical dams in Guatemala, the Proyecto Shek, that is right now creating the prosecution and criminalization of several members of the Maya Kekchi uh, communities. In my territory, the, the interest of big capital to deforest there, deforestate our communal ancestral land is also growing. So there is a a lot of private corporate business that are trying to see that are seeing our territories as profit as money and not as the living systems that means for us and that we have you know uh, take care for thousands of years and that has allowed us to live and also allow to have the climate solutions because the climate solutions are already here the climate solutions are in the ancestral science of indigenous communities and knowledges so we're demanding that to be respected I want to thank you both so much for being with us, Andrea Ixu, Maya Kiche, journalist and activist from Guatemala, Rosa Marina Flores Cruz, indigenous activist from Oaxaca, Mexico, both with the collective Futuros Indígenas, that's Indigenous Futures, here at the UN Climate Summit in Sharm el Sheikh. And now for an update about the case of Ala Abdel Fattah. His family visited with him today in the Wedi El Natrun prison. His sister Mona Saif, who is not there today, tweeted, the news from the visit is not good. Ala suffered a lot in this last period, but at least they saw him and he needed to see them very much. The family says they'll share more details later this afternoon. We'll tweet them out and we'll have more on Ala's case on Friday's program. That does it for our show. Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez will be giving a speech Friday at the Columbia School of Journalism, reflecting on his 40 years of fighting for racial and social justice in journalism. It begins at 4.10 p.m. Friday. See democracynow.org for details on this event and two other speeches Juan is giving. Special thanks to Sharif Abdul Produce Hani Masood, Dennis Moynihan, Nermeen Sheikh here in Sharm el Sheikh. Democracy Now! Produced with Renee Fels, Mike Burke, Dina Guzder, Messiah Rhodes. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.